We're in John, uh, you know what, we're John 14, but I want to start in John 13 for just a few minutes. So John chapter 13 is where we will begin. Jesus uh, said and did a lot of things that most people, I think, would agree with, right? Most people don't have a problem when Jesus tells us to do good things to other people, especially when those other people are doing good things to us. Uh, Most of us don't have a problem with, I don't know, maybe 95% of the things that Jesus said. He said a lot of things that were were about being kind and good and loving and and at peace with people. But you know what? So did a lot of other religious leaders of his day and of our day today. And so with Jesus and a lot of the other religious teachers of his day and our day, there was just no real controversy. And those are not the things that set Christianity apart. If I'm thinking about the question on the screen right now, what is it that sets Christianity apart? And what was it that set Christianity apart? It has to be, there has to be an answer to that. Because for some reason, Christianity exploded from the backwoods of the ancient Near Eastern world into uh, the most um, impactful religion that's ever existed on this planet. What sets it apart? And there are, there are several um, answers to that question for one. It's, um, it's the resurrection of the dead, the resurrection of Jesus from the grave sets Christianity apart. Many folks had claimed that and had claimed to do that. Jesus is the one in history who actually did uh, rise from the grave. And so that sets Christianity apart. But second to the resurrection, I would say that, that comments and, and messages that Jesus gave, like the one that we're examining today from John chapter 14, Outside of the resurrection, it seems like these are the, the statements, the teachings, the actions of Jesus that really set him apart from everybody else. It's his controversial statements, the things that he said that were in conflict with what other people of the day were saying. And so we are examining these I am statements of Jesus, and just by nature of beginning a statement with I am, that's somewhat controversial. And we'll talk a bit about that in a few minutes But Jesus makes very bold claims in his own words. And we've examined some of these very bold claims that Jesus has made. And we have this one today, and we've got John 15, I'm the true vine, next week. But these are, in my opinion, the controversial statements of Jesus. These are the things that set him apart from everybody else and everything else and sets his way of life, uh, the kingdom of God that he came to bring. It's what sets that kingdom apart from everything else on the planet. We examine today what may be one of his most controversial statements, one of the most uh, conflicting statements that he ever said. And you may not think that on the surface because it's very simple. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Now we are coming upon this statement in John 14 verse 6 in the middle of a, of a scene. And if we only talk about this one statement in John 14 6, then we miss a little bit of what's going on. And that's why I wanted you to look at John 13. And we're not gonna, we're not gonna take the time to read through this, but I do want to, uh, to at least show you and let you see what's happening as Jesus leads up to this statement, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. And John 13 is, is where Jesus gathers his closest group of followers into a room. And as they are gathered into this room in John chapter 13, they are discussing among themselves who is going to be the greatest in the kingdom of God. Who is going to have the power? Who's going to have the authority? Who's going to be in charge? Who's got the money bags? Who's going to take care of things? You know, who's the go-to guy in the kingdom of God? They're arguing about who is going to be the greatest. And so they show up in this upper room. They're going to celebrate Passover together as good Jewish folks would do. And as they gather into this upper room, nobody is there to wash their feet, to prepare them for this meal. It would have been customary uh, for someone to be there to, to prepare them for this meal. And nobody's there. Well, you know good and well that the folks who've been arguing about who's the greatest in the kingdom and who's going to be the greatest, they're not going to stoop down and take a servant's slave role in this world. And so, you know, they're not going to get down and wash the feet. And so Jesus gets up from the table, seeing that nobody's going to do it, and he girds himself with a towel. He gets the basin of water. He gets water in it, and he goes around and he washes the disciples' feet. Peter says, I don't know what's going on here, but if you're going to wash my feet, then wash my whole body. And Jesus says, Peter, you still don't understand. That is common in the life of Peter. Let's fast forward a little bit. But Jesus is saying to them, this is what life in the kingdom of God looks like. It's, it's serving one another. It's not 
arguing about who's going to be the greatest. It's not arguing about who's the best, who's got the most power, who's got the most money, who's the prettiest, who, you know, whatever. It's not about who's the greatest. Life in the kingdom of God is about what can I do for somebody else. That in itself is not so controversial. These are Jewish folk. And these Jewish folk would have had laws from the Old Testament that tell them to love their neighbor. And maybe it, it could be said that what Jesus is doing in that upper room in John 13 is, is simply loving his neighbor. But that's not how he views it. Because when you get down to verses 33, 34, 35, that's where Jesus says, now a new commandment I give to you. That you look and see what I've done, how I've treated you, even you who are here and, and arguing about who's the greatest, you look and see how I have treated you even all of you who will disperse and spread and betray me before the night is over, look at what I've done to you. A new commandment I give you. You go love one another. And what's new about it, love one another is not new. What's new about it is as I have loved you. You go do likewise. You go treat people this way. That's, that's kind of where this thing is going. And at the end of John chapter 13, um, he talks to Peter about his denial that's going to be coming up and and he's going to go away, and, and he's going to the cross. And that begins our discussion in John chapter 14. They have questions, real questions, and Jesus knows their anxiety. Don't be troubled. Don't let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God. Believe in me. Right? Common theme in John's gospel is Jesus saying, if you've got faith in God, you can have faith in me. Nobody's ever seen God, but if you've seen me, then you've seen God. I come to bear witness to the one who sent me, Jesus says. And so he often, another extreme claim is that he often lumps himself right there with God. But eventually, they get to this idea of, of he's going away, and we don't know how to get there. We don't know where we're going. We have no clue what you're talking about. And so Jesus eventually says, I'm the way. I'm the truth, and I'm the life, and nobody comes to the Father except through me. That's, a, that's somewhat controversial. We didn't read verse 7 earlier, but I'd like to read it now, because in verse 7, he says, if you had known me, this is Jesus speaking. If, had you known me, then you would have known my Father also. From now on, you do know him, and you have seen him. Well, I thought nobody at any time has ever seen God. Well, we read that. But now we read Jesus saying, if you've seen me, you've seen God. It's extreme. That's controversial. These are the statements that set Jesus apart from everybody else. These are the statements that set the kingdom of God apart from everybody else. This is a controversial claim. It is not controversial if, you know, really all we know is, is, you know, our upbringing today is Christian people in a Christianized world where pretty much everybody we know has some sort of belief and faith in Jesus, then it's not controversial to say he's the way, the truth, and the life. But it is very controversial if this is the first time you've ever heard it. It's incredibly conflicting if you do not believe if you live in a world, in a, in a place in this world that does not believe that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, it is a very controversial statement. And it's a statement like this that will eventually land him on the cross. And so I'd like to talk about it this morning. It's, it's his own words. This is number six out of seven I am statements of Jesus. I am the way, the truth, and the life. What I'd like to show you this morning very briefly is what Jesus is claiming in that statement and then we'll follow up a little bit at the end with how unique this is in the world and what it means for us in our world. First thing I want you to see this morning is that this is an extreme claim. This is extreme. This is, this is Jesus um, making a claim that was really unheard of, and he could back it up, but it was unheard of in his world. It's consistent with all of the other I am statements that we've discussed, it's an extreme claim. When Jesus says, I'm the bread, he's saying there's nothing else that's going to sustain you. When he says, I'm the light of the world, he says, you know, everything else out there is darkness. I am the source of light. When, when he says he is the, the door of the sheep and he's the good shepherd, he's, he is implicating all the other supposed leaders as bandits, as robbers who come to steal, kill, and destroy. But he says, I'm the good shepherd, and I come that you may have life. These are extreme claims that Jesus makes. That may not be our concept of Jesus right now, but it should be our concept of Jesus. He's this unique character in history that, that combines his actions of, of love and humility and service of other people 
He combines those humble, loving, kind actions with extreme claims. And so he will, he will feed thousands and thousands of people who are hungry. That's a good, kind, noble thing for him to do. But he'll back that up with, now look, you, you do not need to work for the food that, that will pass away. I'm the bread of life. Work for food that, that will continue. He will give sight to the blind, a kind action. He will give hearing to the ones who cannot hear. He will raise the ones who have, have lost loved ones. And he will make an extreme claim on the back of that, I am the resurrection and the life. And so he combines these humble, loving, kind actions of healing and feeding and welcoming and teaching and protecting and forgiving with extreme claims. That's who Jesus is. He's drawing a cra- These are the claims that draw a crowd around him. Not just his healings and his feedings, but it's when he claims that if you've seen me, then you've seen the Father. It's his extreme claims like when he says, I and the Father are one. It's when he provides a kind, compassionate healing of a man who's paralyzed, but he slides in an extreme statement of your sins are forgiven. And they say, what are you talking about? Your sins are forgiven. He came to you paralyzed. And he says, which is easier. I could heal the man, and that would kind of be a show, but I'm telling you I operate on a different level than that. And so... Many of Jesus' claims are extreme. That sets Christianity apart. This one is no different. It's not just an extreme claim. Let's break it down even further. It's a very simple claim. When Jesus says, I am the way, he's making, I think, a very simple claim. He is not saying that you can't find things that are true and real anywhere else out in the world. Truth is out there. What Jesus is claiming here and claiming to be the way is that he is the only way to really know the Father. That's the context, right? I'm the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody comes to the Father except by me. And then there's that verse 7. From now on, you know the Father and you have seen him because you have seen me. Jesus is making an extreme but a very simple claim. If you've seen me, he says, then you've seen God. By making this, this audacious claim that he is the way, Jesus is implicitly undermining all the other religious systems in our world. And there are plenty. There are the Ten Commandments of Judaism. And Jesus says those Ten Commandments are not the way. I am the way. Within other religions in the ancient world, there's, uh, there are the, the Eightfold Path of Buddhism, the Pillars of Truth of the Muslim world, the Pillars of Action in other religions. And Jesus is saying none of, none of these, none of these are the way. He says, I am, very simply, I am the way. God himself is the way. It's simple. It is not complicated. He's the way. It's extreme. It is simple. The third thing that I would tell you about it this morning is that it's real. It's a claim of reality. He says, I am the way and the truth, a truth claim about what is real in this world. This one is interesting in John's gospel and the whole setup of John's gospel. He begins his gospel in John chapter 1, verse 1, in the beginning was the word, The Logos, that's the word translated word for us. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Nothing is made that is made without the Word. That's John chapter 1, first few verses. And so Jesus, in John's mind, is there in the beginning as uh, preexistent Logos, what we have probably translated in our Bibles as Word. Well, in our world, just like theirs, the word Word has different meanings. If I come up to you this morning and I say, what's the word, my friend? You would probably not be thinking about the word of the day. You'd be thinking about what's new, what's, what's going on in life, what's the word, right? We can talk about word as, as a literal word. We can use word as a form of agreement, word. So word can mean a lot of different things. It's one word with a lot of different meanings. Same was true in the ancient world with logos. By the time of Jesus, that particular Greek word, logos, came to mean something like reality. What is meaning? It came to mean uh, uh, about, it came to have a meaning of reason. And they would imply that Logos was really the reason for living. And so Jesus comes, presented by John, as the word that brings life. He is the reason. He's real. He is the truth. He is what is real and true in this world. Now, what's interesting about that to me is that Jesus does not imply here, again, that we cannot find truth in other places. In fact, there's a really interesting 
verse in Matthew 23, it's verse 34, where Jesus is, is having a discussion with the Pharisees. Matthew 23 is where he gives them the seven woes. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees. Uh, and really comes down pretty harshly on those religious leaders of the day. But in verse 34, he's bringing that section to a close, and he says, I sent you. I, I sent you prophets, and I sent you teachers who told you the truth, and you did away with them. And so Jesus is saying, even, even other preachers and teachers, anybody who comes and preaches anything that is true, Jesus says, they came from me. And so in our minds, I think it's helpful to get this, this list a little bit more clear in our minds. Jesus is not saying that there's a body of truth over here and there's, there's God and Jesus and the Spirit over here and sometimes they coexist. That's not what he's saying at all. It's not truth separated from God or God separated from truth in their own little corners. What Jesus is saying is that if you come across truth in any form, any, anything that is true comes forth from God. He is the truth. He is the truth. He's not saying I'm pointing to truth. He's not saying sometimes I say things that are true. He's not saying sometimes I live in a way that is a true way to live. He's saying I am the truth. I am what's real in life. And so when we come across truth in any form, it is not outside our faith to believe that truth. It is part of, of Christianity. It's, it's part of what Jesus brings. Paul does this. Paul knows this. In Acts 17, he shows up uh, in a place that, that doesn't know about Jesus at this point at Mars Hill, and he's going to preach a sermon. Um, I think that the sermon Paul preaches on Mars Hill in Acts 17 is the one that, that has the most weight for us today because it's preached to an audience like us. They're not Jewish. They're Gentiles. Um, and so, so he preaches this message. And one of the things that he does in the sermon on Mars Hill in Acts 17 is he quotes from poets from their own day. He takes what would have been commonly understood poems, writings of their day, and he says, this is true. One of, the, one of the poets he quotes from talks about how we are all the offspring of God. And Paul looks at that and says, you know what? That's true. And then he uses that truth that they share together. They all believe that. We are the offspring of God in that Greek ancient world. He takes that and he builds upon it and says, let me tell you about the God who is our father. That's what he does. And so as Christians, we look for things that are true. We shun things that are lies, that are deceptive, that are not truth. It's not truth over here and Jesus over there, and sometimes they run together. It's always that if we find truth, we have found something that has come from God. This is how John pre presents him. He is the truth. The fourth thing that I would let you know about this, this particular claim in John 14, 6 is that is a, a claim of clarity. He says, I am the life. It's extreme, it's simple, it is true, and it's, it's a claim that clarifies things for us. So often in the church, in Christianity, we talk about what we believe, and we should. We should talk about our faith. We talk about what we believe. And we talk about what is right and what's wrong, and by all means, we should talk about what is right and what's wrong and what's good and what is evil. That's what Jesus points to when he says, I'm the way and the truth. He's saying, there's a, there, there's a way. And there are things that are true and things that are not true, right and wrong. But we need to talk about our lifestyles too. We need to talk about the daily life that we live. We need to talk about the kind of people that we are at school tomorrow and the kind of people we are at work tomorrow and the kind of people we are for the rest of the day today we need to talk about a life that is conducive to living a life with God. Through John's gospel, through the gospels, through the New Testament writings, it seems to me that life, that what we do with our days is important to God. This is why we talked about this a lot last week, so I won't rehash it today, but this is why Paul so many times says, you gotta put off the anger and the wrath and the malice and the gossip. You gotta put off those things and make changes in your behavior, calls to changed behavior. And so let's not misread John 14, 6, the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody comes to the Father, but my, let's don't misread it as Jesus just talking about who's in or who's out. Instead, let's read it as him claiming to be the way, the truth, and the life, a lifestyle that we are to live. Living in the way of Jesus, 
by the truth of Jesus is the only way for us to live the life that Jesus intends for us to live. It's clarifying for us. If we decide that we're going to go to him for the truth about what is real, what's right, what's wrong, what's good, what's evil, if we're going to go to him and try to seek his will and live in his way, then it cuts out all the other choices that i got to make in my life. If I can decide that I really do believe that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, then I don't have to go searching for other ways. I don't have to go out looking for other truths. I found it. I don't have to go out and look for what is the good life. What's the life that I'm supposed to live? I found it in Jesus. And so it's not just extreme and simple and real. It clarifies for us what we are supposed to do. I would leave you with another one. It is also an exclusive claim. He does not say, I am a way, a truth, a way to live life. He says, I am the. And I got to tell you, sometimes we look at that as restrictive, but I would hope that we don't look at this exclusive claim of Jesus as just a restrictive way to live. This is a good thing. This is Jesus saying the ideal, it's an exclusive ideal, is that every person is going to live the kind of life that Jesus has come to bring. That universal truth and goodness and kindness has become a person who calls every human to follow his word. And that would be a great thing. It's not just a particular way to live. It's not just a particular set of truths to live by. It is the way. Wouldn't it be great if we all lived by that way? And so the nature of the claim is this. It's extreme. Yes, it is extreme. But it is also very simple. It's true. It's real. It clarifies what our lives are to be about, and it is exclusive. It's also unique. Jesus says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. And then we haven't talked about the second part of John 14, 6, where he says, nobody comes to the Father except through me. This is a unique claim. There is no in-between here. He either is the way, the truth, and the life, or he is a liar. He either is the way, the truth, and the life, or he is out of his mind when he says this. There's really no in-between. When he says, no one comes to the Father but by me, he is making an exclusive claim about God, about what is real and true and meaningful in this life. He's making an exclusive claim, but it is an exclusive claim that has a door of inclusiveness to it. Let me tell you what I mean by that. This whole discussion must be undergirded by the idea that we are recipients of the grace of God. Now, however we define that or think of that, you know, that can be different, I guess, for every person. But we've got to understand that we are recipients of the grace of God, no matter what. Whatever we believe about works, whatever we believe about faith, and whatever we believe about grace and how they all three work together, we must all, we have to understand that we are recipients of benefactors of God's grace. By grace you've been saved through faith, Paul says in Ephesians 2, not of works lest any man should boast, but we are created for good works in Christ Jesus. We are his workmanship, Ephesians 2, verses 8, 9, and 10. So we need to have a foundational understanding of how we are recipients of the grace of God. That is the opposite of what I think I would call moralism. Moralism is the idea that I'm good enough, moral enough to earn God's favor. Earn God's favor. It's the idea that, hey, I'm not so bad. At least when I compare myself to other folks that I know, I'm definitely not so bad. I'm I'm really a, a pretty good person and probably good enough on my own. That's not what Jesus says. We are recipients of the grace of God. And what that means is that Jesus, in saying nobody comes to the Father but by me, means that people can come to the Father. There is an inclusiveness to this exclusive claim. And what Jesus seems to promote through the rest of his life is that even the weakest and the worst, in our minds, and our human thinking, even the weakest and the worst get to come to God through Jesus, not by their own power, not by our own goodness or anything like that. Even the weakest and the worst can be included in the kingdom and the family of God. And that is good news. 
if you're the kind of person that sometimes knows that you rebel against God, it is good news. It's gospel. If you're the kind of person that knows sometimes you seek a different way than the way of Jesus. You don't want to. Sometimes you don't mean to, but sometimes it just happens. It's good news if you're the kind of person that knows sometimes you seek a truth outside of Jesus. You want to live by maybe what you think or, or what, you, what you, uh, you wish were true instead of what is true. And if you know that about yourself, and this is good news. If you know that you're the kind of person that sometimes seeks the good life outside of Jesus, if you know that sometimes you are prone to wander from God, if you have a suspicion that sometimes you just go days, weeks, months of ignoring God and his calls in your life, then it's good news to know that nobody comes to the Father but by Jesus. It's good news. It allows us to see that Jesus welcomes us into his family, into his kingdom, into a different way of understanding life, into a different way of living. And so it's good for us. It's also good for the people around us. It's also good for the people around us. Nobody comes to the Father but by me, Jesus says, and that is good news for me. But this is not something that Jesus says to me. It's not something Jesus just says to you. It's something Jesus says about me, and it's, he says it about you, and he says it about all the people that you know, that you deal with, that you talk to. He says, nobody comes to the Father but by me, but people can come to the Father through me, and that means you can come and I can come, and the people that you like can come, and the people that you don't like, they can come to God too. It's an inclusive claim. And so think about the person. Just a little thought experiment here. Think about the person who dislikes you the most. Think about the person who can't stand you, who doesn't like you, never has a kind thing to say about you. They say good things about other folks. Think about the person who dislikes you the most. That one's pretty easy. Can you identify the person that you dislike the most? And it may be because you may dislike them because they dislike you and y'all got this cycle going where who can dislike each other the most? I'd like for you to think about the person that you dislike the most, maybe because they don't like you. If you have an enemy, now you may not label them as an enemy because we're Christian people and we don't talk about enemies. But if you've got somebody who doesn't like you and you don't like them, I want you to have that person in your mind. And I want you to remember why they are your enemy. Why you don't like them and why they don't like you and why y'all can't get along. I want you to know why. Did you know Jesus calls you to welcome that person even as your neighbor? Man, that's tough, isn't it? You talk about controversial claims of Jesus, yes. I am the bread of life is controversial, and I am the light of the world is controversial, and the door of the sheep and the good shepherd and the way, the truth, and the life, and nobody comes to the Father but by me. That's controversial. All these things are controversial. I don't know of anything that's more controversial than Jesus saying, hey, it's easy for you to love those who love you, isn't it? And it's easy for you to do good things to those people who do good things to you. That's easy. That doesn't require much out of me. It's easy for me to be welcoming to people who are already welcoming to me. That's easy. But Jesus says in Matthew chapter 5, what do you do more than others? 43 to 48 of Matthew 5. What do you do more than others? Even the unbelievers can love those who love them. Even the unbelievers can do good to those who do good to them. That's easy. That's not doing a whole lot. But I tell you, Jesus says, can you love your enemy? The one that you don't like and they don't like you and y'all got this cycle of dislike going on in your life. You know why there's that cycle and they're your enemy? Jesus says that person is your neighbor and more than that, Jesus says, you've heard it said, just love one another, love your neighbor, do unto others. I'm telling you, love your enemy. That hard for you. My guess is that if we're honest, the answer to that's yes. It is hard to love the person that you know hates you. It's hard to love the person, actively do something good for the person who actively works against you. That's hard. 
And I think maybe it's hard because we don't have the mindset of Jesus, this mindset. A lot of times we look at nobody comes to the Father but my me, and we think he's talking about me. Could you entertain maybe for a minute that he's talking about the person that you don't like? And they don't like you, but somehow in the kingdom of God, we got to find a way to exist together. Nobody comes to the Father but by me. And that's a comforting thought when he's talking about me. It may be a bit uncomfortable when he's talking about the folks that I'm just not so sure about. And so understanding this inclusivity of this exclusive claim of Jesus not only helps me understand that people like me, the weakest and the worst, can come to God, but it also allows me not to see people that I don't really get along with and disagree with I don't see them as fools. I don't have to see them as dangerous. I don't have to see them as an enemy. The final thing that I'd leave you with is there is a call here. No one comes to the Father except by me. And with this, Jesus is inviting people, calling people to follow him as the way of living life, as the true way of living life, as the good life that we are called to seek in our lives. And with that must come some exclusive demands on our behavior. Not somebody else's. All right, don't, don't let your mind wander into what somebody else needs to change in their life so that they'll be pleasing to you and everybody else. God places exclusive demands on our behavior. And we may see that as restrictive. I get it. We may see that as as, as holding us back from what we think we want to do. We may see that as, as um, a restraining us in some kind of way, and we may see that as a negative, but I want to tell you that it's good. That whatever we find as a call on our lives from Jesus saying, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, and nobody comes to the Father except by me, and if you've seen me, you've seen God now, whatever we call, we find calling us out of that is a good thing. There are demands on the behavior of a Christian for instance, one of, the, one of the great commands of Christianity is, you've heard it said, do not commit adultery on your spouse. But I'm telling you, do not even look upon a woman to lust after her, Jesus says. You've already committed adultery with her in your heart. Well, these calls of Jesus, oh, don't they sound a little restrictive? Who are you to tell me what to do with my life? Who are you to tell me what to do with my thoughts and, and my desires? Who are you to tell me? how I should live my life. Well, you can see it as that kind of restriction. But doesn't that claim alone, that call alone, doesn't it free us to be better husbands and better wives? Doesn't it free us to be present in the lives of our kids and create some order within our homes and in our lives? And so it's good. Another example, a claim in Christianity, do not lie, tell the truth, don't lie. Don't bear false witness. Put away all lying and falsehood from your mouth, Paul says. And we say, I don't know, that's kind of restrictive. Who's Paul to tell me what I should say and when I should tell the truth and when I, when I can't tell the truth? Who is Paul to tell me not to lie? Sounds a bit restrictive to me. Well, that's one way to look at it. Another way to look at it is, man, aren't our families better when we're not lying to each other? Aren't our schools and our neighborhoods and our workplaces better when they are places of truth, where people are honest with one another and nobody's lying and nobody's deceptive and nobody is, is telling you one thing but telling somebody else somebody else, doesn't it create better order in our lives? The commands of God are not burdensome. They're not grievous. They're good. They're good. They create order. They remove chaos. They bring good things into our lives. They keep evil things away from our lives. And we accept this call if we recognize Jesus as who he says he is, the way to live, the true way to live, the way to have life, the abundant life that he promises. And so maybe the calls that Jesus makes on our lives are not just to burden us and to hold us down. Maybe the way that he calls us is to restrain us to bring about things that are good for us. It's an extreme claim, I'll tell you that. It's very simple. Now, simple doesn't mean that it's easy to work out in our lives. Simple means it's kind of simple to understand. He's the way, the truth, and the life. It's a call that clarifies for us what we should be about, 
and how we can cut out all the distractions and how we can find what is true and real and meaningful in our lives. This is what it is. It's simple, it's extreme, it clarifies, it's exclusive, but it's also a bit inclusive. There is no in-between. What Jesus is saying is the weakest and the worst can come, whether that's us or whether that's what I think about somebody else. There are exclusive demands on our behavior, but those are not negatives. Those are things that free us to be the kind of people God wants us to be. So here's my question. The way, the truth, and the life, nobody comes to the Father but by me, exclusive claim, those are Jesus' own words. If you were going to come to the Father, or to back it up to the first part of that statement, if you were going to really seek the way of Jesus, what would you limit in your life? If you were really going to seek to live in the way of Jesus, if you were gonna follow his path, if you were gonna live in the way, by the way, the most common descriptor of the early group of Christians who were following Jesus around and trying to live by his words and live by his truth, they weren't called the church, they weren't called Christians, that doesn't happen for years, they were called the way. When Paul's trying to figure out some folks he can throw in prison because of their faith in Christ, he's going to Damascus to see if he can find any among the way. Where do you think they got that idea? because they're trying to live their lives in the way of Jesus. And they know that if I'm gonna live my life in the way of Jesus, there are some things that need to be restrained. There are some things that need to grow and there are some things that need to be cut off. There are some things that I need to progress in and there are some things that I need to limit. And so if you were going to follow Jesus as the way, the truth, if you were gonna live by his truth and not somebody else's, not what you've heard about him, but what he is, And if you were gonna find the life that he comes to bring, what would need to be restrained in you? What behaviors or thoughts or attitudes or actions do you think he'd want to limit in your life and put a check on in your life? What would he do? What exclusive demands of Jesus would you give in to today? If you were going to seek him as the way and the truth and the life, and if you were gonna try to come to the Father through him, I wonder what exclusive demands of Jesus I would give in to today. Would it be the exclusive demand to love your neighbor as yourself, to love your enemy? Would it be the exclusive demand to do unto others as you would have them to do unto you? Would it be the exclusive demand to seek him above all else? Would it be to recognize him as the way, the truth, and the life? And and to come to the Father through him. In his own words, Jesus says, this is who I am. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody comes to the Father except through me. And today, if you were going to, in his words, come to the Father, what would that look like for you? Would it be you being baptized into Christ, united in his death, buried with him in baptism, coming up out of the waters, freed, restraining yourself out of those waters to live the kind of life and seeking the way, the truth, and the life? Would you come up out of those waters ready to put off those old things Paul talks about, put on the new things, the good behaviors, the kindness, the compassionate hearts, the good of life? And so maybe you come to the Father through Jesus today and you're baptized into Christ, sins washed away free to live a different kind of life. Maybe today you are baptized years ago, but you've sought different ways of living outside of the way. You've looked for different truths that somebody told you or you thought up on your own maybe and you got it and you're trying to live by that and you've got away from the truth because you're seeking something else and it's led to a life that you didn't really want and you see that there are things that need to grow in my life and things I need to restrain in my life and things I need to cut out and things I need to plant and there are exclusive demands on my behavior that I need to give in to and so maybe you seek the Father through Jesus as the way, the truth, and the life and you give in to whatever changes he would have you make if you were gonna come to the Father through him and find the healing and find um, the help that you need through him. And so in his own words, he invites you to come. He is the way. He is the truth. He is the life. Nobody comes to the Father but by him. And today, if you want to come to the Father through him, here's the opportunity to do that. 